Let's immerse ourselves in the dark hole of obsessive fandoms. Being part of a fandom is amazing. In fact, one of the best aspects of fandoms is that it's a collective. Especially with the development and use of social media, we can see a technology-driven semiotic democracy at work in which fans have equal access and possibility to reinterpret a media text and discard the author's main interpretation, which makes him lose his status of gatekeeper for that specific media text. So fans start creating their own alternatives by, for example, creating slash fanfiction which lets them break into the canon and disrupt the narrow sexualities which have been prescribed to some specific characters by the main creator. Most often than not displaced by having character X finally realizing his love of sexual attraction to character Y, uh, finally embracing their true needs and feeling better because of it. This motive is referred to as hurt slash comfort. Without being put in these hurt slash comfort scenarios, the characters would not have the possibility to interact with one another in a way other than the friend binary. I'm your best Man. friend. Yeah, of course you are. Of course, you're my best friend. Or the enemy binary that are imposed by the mainstream narrative. Shut up, Malfoy. <laughs> A widespread theory of popular culture holds that corporate culture industry prioritizes profit over quality, making pop culture a form of hegemony used to spread dominant ideologies. This fits quite well with the mainstream media portraying stereotypical characters, prominently white and straight males. However, Henry Jenkins, with his theory of participatory culture, was one of the first to suggest that media fans are not passive, but they become active producers and manipulators of meaning. That's how fan interaction has become a social activity, which, at its best, lets us analyze and critique prescriptive ideas of gender and sexuality in these communities. Lately, creators have tried to close up this divide of ownership by providing uh, forms of fan service as a way to reward the fans. So by, for example, highlighting a specific intensity between two of the shift characters. The problem is that most often than not, this fan service is not seen as a tease uh, by certain fans, but rather as a confirmation of the alleged romantic or sexual innuendo uh, and relationship between these two characters or two real people. It should also be said though that there is a fine line between fan service and queer baiting, and some creators are at fault in this because they insert too much homoerotic subtext as a way to appeal to a larger audience or to a certain audience, only to then backtrack trivializing the importance of LGBTQ plus representation in media and in a way ridiculize fans who are just trying to make everything gay. Well, the term fan comes from fanatic, which means crazy. Uh, we often use the term fangirl as a derogatory way uh, to represent certain types of people, usually girls, and their need to grow up. These characterizations of frenzied fans, the screaming and crying teenagers narrative, have stigmatized fan culture and the people who participate in it. And what's your name, darling? I'll just make it out to Evelyn. But there is a line, and not much of a fine line at that, between being a normal fan and becoming part of an excessive fandom. And this line is crossed when the difference between reality and fantasy becomes unclear. I know that Supernatural is just a book, okay? I know the difference between fantasy and reality. Becky, it's all real. <sighs> I knew it! <sighs> While normal fans may search for connections with others about a specific fandom, the fanatics see that ship as an important aspect of their identity and the so-called deviants take a step even further by relating to the fandom as a way to organize a concept of self. Our attachments to these ships can be somehow explained through what researchers have called experience taking, in which people uh, change their own thoughts or behavior to match those of a fictional character which they somehow identify with. In order for this subconscious phenomenon to happen, people need to forget 
temporarily about themselves, their own self-concept and their own identity, in order to really lose themselves into this fictionalized world. It's just, it's, if a person doesn't have a sense of achievement in their real life, it's easy to lose themselves in a virtual world where they can get a false sense of accomplishment. Yeah, jabber, jabber, jabber. Okay, boys, Queen Penelope's back online. In fact, it may even be easier for us to empathize with fictional characters rather than with actual people, because with actual people, we don't know everything about them. We try to fill in the details of the things about their lives that we don't know about, whereas with fictional characters we have the perception of having an intimate knowledge about them. But despite our immersive and emotionally strong attachment to certain characters, this experience is temporary. The philosopher Kendall Walton, for example, described our feelings while watching a horror movie not as fear, but quasi-fear. So what we feel, although it may seem extremely potent at the time, is a quasi-emotion. It's not based on belief, but on make-belief. The time frame in which our brain blurs the lines between fiction and reality has been defined as a leaf, and is what makes, makes watching a movie enjoyable. The leaf system develops more as we grow up. That's why children are usually more captured by stories than adults are, because their leaf system is not quite developed as yet, so they don't understand the difference between a character, an actor playing a character, and that what is happening to that specific character is just fake. Sometimes fanaticism seems to fit pretty well into this underdeveloped system of a leaf. I see that particularly when we're talking about shipping real people. Fans take non-stop voyeuristic dreams on social media by looking at snippets of the daily life of certain celebrities and start to think that they know everything about them. Because of their loyalty and undying devotion, uh, fans expect entertainers to owe them something, namely the possibility of entering their intimate life. So we see people together and we start thinking how person X and person Y would be a great couple together. What's their arm? It's just a fantasy. They're celebrities. They're the ones that decided to put themselves out there and together with the perks comes the consequences. This is a dangerous part of thought that starts to make us transform these entertainers from people into public properties whose sole purpose in life is that of entertaining us. These communities also portray a lot of casual homophobia and misogyny into them. It may seem like an oxymoron, but think for example how real female partners of shipped MM couples are usually either radicalized or vilified for getting in the way of the pair. Or how within the teen hunting practice, fans appropriate queer labels to people based solely on a set of visual and behavioral signs playing on common stereotypes of perceived dominance or submissiveness. Let's go back to our X and Y couple. At some point we stop being, oh they're so cute together, and start fantasizing that they actually are. We collect evidence that we share with others about why they are in fact a couple. In this case, the element of collectivity within a fandom doesn't help in alleviating this sort of fantasies. When people are part of a group, they often experience the individuation or a loss of self-awareness. When people de-individuate, they are less likely to follow normal restraints and inhibitions. Because groups generate a sense of emotional excitement, this leads to the problem provocation of behaviors that a person would not typically engage in if alone. We want to invite you to have lunch with us every day for the rest of the week. Oh, it's okay. Coolness. So we'll see you tomorrow. On Wednesdays we wear pink. So, once a whole group of people start believing that these two people are actually together, it's downhill from there. But the truth is that we're talking about the reality of two people using snippets of their lives and most often they're not their uh, marketing personas obtained through social media. By discussing in such length every small perceived clue about their life, we're in fact rewriting and refabricating their identities into what we would like to see. This creates the additional problem of making these people one-dimensional. Suddenly everything they do and everything they say is related to our perceived reality of them 
and we are failing to see what they're actually trying to communicate with us as entertainers. Some view these problems as objectification and I tend to agree. Now nowadays these kind of terms have been used so much that in a way they've lost their meaning. To see how objectification is related to this I particularly refer to Nassenbaum which has defined seven notions involved in this phenomenon specifying that objectification can happen when one or more of these elements are present. Following Kant, Nassenbaum understands humanity as an individual's capacity for rational choice. This gives human beings an absolute value that must always be respected in moral choice and action. If one completely denies another's autonomy, directing their conduct and behavior in every aspect, one might come to treat these people as a tool for their purposes. Fans give so much support to these people, so much so that sometimes it is overwhelming. Because of their undivided attention, fans believe that their expectations should always be met. And when they don't, when the lives of these real life people don't stack up to the fantasies that we have attached to them, then the reaction could be quite overwhelming as well. A lot of the problem, I think, lies on our obsession and worshipping of celebrities and entertainers or just generally famous people. These people don't have any real linking into our everyday life. Celebrities, entertainers, famous people are just people like you and me. They appear on our screens, play on our radio, um, fe are featured on magazines, but they don't live there. While it is completely healthy and natural to like an actor, we really need to start detaching ourselves from the pervasive virtual reality that we have learned to consume on a daily basis. Rather than idolizing what are fundamentally strangers, start to look up to the people who make an actual difference in your life. And instead of simply watching someone else succeeding, start to work on yourself to try and achieve what you have set up yourself to do. That's it, this was my video about slash fandom, fandom in general, and shipping people in real life. I hope that I haven't offended anyone, I probably did. Make sure to subscribe if you like this video and would like to see other videos from me and as usual uh, feedback is very much appreciated if you have a different opinion from mine don't worry share it in the comments below and I'll probably reply to you. Thank you for watching.